Hello and welcome to another episode of the SciShow Talk Show, where today we've got some weird things coming and we are joined by Heidi Sadivi. Heidi, what is it that you do? I do education and outreach for the Flathead Lakers up at Flathead Lake. Uh, we're the largest lake west of the Mississippi. In case you didn't know that. I did. We were talking about this before. <laughs> Not east of the Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're the last watershed in the United States without these mussels. These so, little guys yeah, so. are quagga mussels. Quagga and, mussels. or quagga, quagga. I, I, I pretend these, I'm from Canada sometimes. Are these not zebra mussels? No. Those are different. Zebra mussels are a close relative, so they're okay. in the same genus, um, different okay. species. These are quagga mussels out of Lake Mead. Um, the scary part is we get our drinking water from an aquifer. Yes, we do. It's really clean, we're really That's lucky. I love my water. Um, Las Vegas actually gets a lot of their drinking water directly from Lake Mead. They have to filter out filter the little, it, the little and spores, I guess. It's, it's a lot, it's a big process. It's an expensive process. We are really, really fortunate not to have these mussels. So what, what, am, I, what am I looking at here? What happened? This guy in Lake Mead decided that he wanted to start a business selling educational materials. Okay. So he took some of these pipes and he put them, they like deeper water, so probably 30 feet down, and you mm -hmm. just let them sit for six months. And they like little holes, they don't like the sunlight. So these were probably down like that. Yeah. Um, and, and then you just, they just sat for six months, and this is how many mussels can get on a pipe within just that six months. They grow fast, their lifespans are three to five years, so they don't live that long. And then they have huge die-offs, and so then all of these mussels die at the same time, they wash up on the beaches, and you can feel how sharp those are, mm -hmm. that's what your beaches are. So also, if we get those into Flathead or anywhere in the Northwest, yeah. um, this, is, that makes this the, is what we walk makes on. makes the beach a lot and less so, fun. Yeah, 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 and so people go through a lot of Band-Aids in the Midwest. And then what, he just lacquers them? And then he, he bakes them first. <laughs> <laughs> to, to in get, his own personal oven. To get all, all of the... <laughs> Honey, what's for dinner? <laughs> um, and even in a lot of states, you can't possess dead ones because to monitor for these, we do uh, Edna electronic DNA sampling, mm -hmm. and dead mussels will set off a false positive. And so even in the state of Montana, um, you need to have permits to, to even have, have these dead ones. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, so we're really careful. We don't want false positives. We don't want... So even if you know you have a boat and you have mussels on it, you know they're dead. If you launch your boat, even those dead mussels could cause a huge issue. Not as big of a problem if they were alive. If they were alive, it, be would, be, it would be a much bigger issue. So invasive species are a huge problem. Everywhere. Yeah, all over the world. How do these guys get transported? So how, like, how do you like, get from one lake to another? These got to the Great Lakes in a ballast tank um, from the Caspian Sea is where they're native to, the Black Sea mm -hmm. and the Caspian Sea. So they came over on ballast tanks in the late 80s. So these big tankers just fill up tanks to make the buoyancy correct exactly. and then they yeah. dump it when they... Get their cargo. Okay. Cargo weighs them down. They empty the water. And that was in the late 80s. And in 2007, they got west of the Mississippi in Lake Mead. Mm. Um, so this is these are from Lake Mead, and that happened in 2007. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So did yeah. they know? How, did that just like happen? Like somebody took their boat from like overland? That's really the only way they spread. I mean, they obviously they don't have feet. They don't. Right. They don't run across the <laughs> land. It's not like oh, it's overcrowded here. <laughs> I'm gonna go find a new lake. Oh, there's, there's not like birds like picking them up and dropping them. They have done studies, and they haven't found that birds okay. can do that. Um, so it's all human transport. All human transport, and they can live outside of the water for 30 days. So yeah. if you have your boat in the water and an adult mussel attaches to it, mm -hmm. then 30 days, it could still be perfectly fine. And that's plenty of time to get to, the, to Montana or mm -hmm. wherever. And then the baby mussels are called villagers. They don't have little shells. So each one of these mussels can produce one million babies a year. Mm. Well, all the female ones. So that's how they also can reproduce so quickly. And they don't have any native predators. So the little... Baby mussels don't have shells, but they can still live in standing water okay. for about a week. Mm. And so even that week transporting and just your, your bilge, if you have water in your bilge mm -hmm. or your live wells or anything, you could have these species there and not even realize it. A lot of people will just, you know, if it's just on their life jacket and they're just saying, mm -hmm. well, we cleaned our boat, that's great. Well, maybe you didn't clean your life jacket. So, so like just like, just they're tiny, these things. Microscopic. Yeah. So they're just, they could just be in. Anything. Yeah. That's. Scary. That seems like an impossible battle to fight to me. 
And a lot of people say that. And it's not But impossible. I mean, so far, we're clean. We're good. And a lot of thing is always exercise precaution. So even though I can tell you that Flathead Lake is clean, mm -hmm. and I'm fairly certain it is, there could be things in there that I don't know about. So even if I leave Flathead and go somewhere else, I'm mm -hmm. going to clean everything and pretend that it does have it because mm -hmm. we don't know for sure. Um, there are lakes that they'll find mussels and they take the water level down and realize that they've had mussels for years. And so all those boats are going back and forth. Um, that's not a very common case, but mm -hmm. it, it could happen. So always practice due diligence. Right. So. I'm looking at this, and what if I'm just saying, well, this just looks like a lot of good bird food and fish food and, you know, just more, more life for the lake. What's the big problem? Are, are they out competing other little mussels that I don't they, care about? They attach to other mussels and yeah. right around the seam so the other mussels can't Oh, can't eat. Little jerks. <laughs> so, and so they actually will starve the native okay. native mussels and clam species. There are pictures they can actually attach to crayfish claws, and then mm. the crayfish can't use their claws. They've attached to, I mean, dragonfly larvae. They will mm. attach to anything. They'll attach to aquatic plants. Um, or, and anything that they, they have bissel threads, so it's these little threads um, on their butt mm -hmm. that can attach to anything and no native mussel can do that, at least in Montana. So if you see any mussel that's attached to anything, it's, it's not a native mussel. Mm -hmm. um, and so those bissel threads give it a huge competitive advantage and um, they're not palatable. They don't have any native predators, so mm -hmm. nothing here can really eat them. They did try bringing in a native or an, a fish from its native mm -hmm. place. That eats them. Um, and now that the round goby is an invasive species. Oh, good job, us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it seems like a common story. Yeah, um, it really is. And so economically, as far like that, it sounds, sounds like a disaster environmentally. Is Are there economic problems? I would think there, yes. I mean, if these got into a hydroelectric right. power facility, then each turbine has to be cleaned annually and they sometimes will try using chlorine, but that's not good for the water. Mm -hmm. They're testing all sorts of things right now. Um, hot water is the most efficient, but you're talking thousands, tens of thousands of dollars per turbine, per dam, annually, because you, you can't get yeah. rid of these once they're here. That sounds like an expensive problem. It would, uh, Idaho, it would be about $100 million a year. Montana, it would be greater than that. So. Well, that sounds like if, if we would were to properly uh, put put the you know the economics to bear on this that we would we would just spend a lot of money trying to stop this from happening. Oh yeah, yeah. This is, is that the happening. Case. Um, it is. It, it's happening more and more. We are seeing it. Um, we're doing a lot of prevention efforts. Uh, we started out with just a few boat inspection stations in 2007, 2008. We now have I think over a dozen permanent boat inspection stations. Boats coming into Montana have to be inspected. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a lot of money is going towards that prevention. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So uh, how, how would you gauge Flathead Lake's health at the moment? It is one of the cleanest lakes in the nation. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was super fascinating. Um, and it's great to have these sort of, you know, treasures here in Montana and to have people like you protecting them. So thank you thank for coming you. on the show. Thank you for having me. And thank you guys for watching. If you want to keep getting smarter with us here at SciShow, you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe.